this. So it's just one of the variables. I had them for yeah. cardio yeah. fit yeah. and then yeah. yeah. kit. So we never got to do the blood glucose. Okay. It's here somewhere. I think yeah. it's in. Yeah, yeah. Right. Everything, so, everything's, everything's everywhere. Here. Uh, <laughs> but, so okay, actually it might be in the cabinets yeah. back there. We can look later. But yeah, in the Proteus room in those cabinets, yeah. in my hunch. Uh, Mark is here now and he has keys. Yeah. Okay. Did you go to the like? Uh, we just got the, the, the grad assistant key. You didn't get the key, so we didn't get any yeah, of the like keys. No, I think like Mark is the only person who has that key. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And the gal. Yeah, we can get from from the gal. Uh, all right. So we're gonna get into protein catabolism today. We're gonna be transitioning into anabolism. Uh, so the anabolic transition is coming. But we're finishing up fasting and catabolism. Take a look away. Did the zero and one version? Oh, you did it? <laughs> that, yeah, bless your heart. I I concur. I, I offer a supplemental blessing to that heart. Um. So getting into protein catabolism. This is actually in the inverse order. Um, but Christian Bale, you know, when he was Batman and when he was the machinist, I mean, there's a hundred pound difference between the two. He actually, he went up in the opposite order. He gained a hundred pounds in like one year. Uh, but what happens in the presence of fasting, in the presence of something more extreme than fasting, in the presence of caloric deficits, in the presence of um, an excess of aerobic activity? What actually happens to the tissue? Where does protein go? So far, we only have two names. We have the Bob Marley's over the top, John, and we have Rectomycin, Rectomycin, um, and then we have one and four and five. So, at your leisure, but hustle the leisure a little bit. We'll get some team names. The points are updated. Um, yeah, the, the, the Mario one up mushroom is still going with Ractomycin. Uh, team Jaman is in second place now. <laughs> so plenty of plenty of catch up time uh, to get your your points racked up by the end. Remember, every single person in your team gets that amount of bonus points of extra credit points at the end of the semester. And so that can drag stuff up. So we've been talking about fat metabolism, about fat loss, uh, you know, beginning with lipolysis and ending with strategies, right? Strategies to promote it. So a, a case study that could appear in some accountable format is in 2004, Christian Bale playing the lead role in The Machinist, weighed 120 pounds. He was trying, apparently trying to get under 100 pounds, but he's six feet tall. Um, I don't think it says he's six feet tall anywhere in here, but you can look that up. So he's six feet tall, 120 pounds. Between 2005 and 2008, Christian Bale, portraying Batman, weighed 220 pounds. So here we have the machinist, here we have Batman. Um, then he was normal-ish for a while. In late 2017, filming for the movie Vice began. He gained 40 pounds to play the role of Dick Cheney, mostly in his tummy tum-tum. It was worth it, Bale reasoned, as he won a Golden Globe for his performance. And in his acceptance speech, this is true, he thanked Satan for his, for his inspiration on how to accurately execute the role of Dick Cheney. Um, Cheney's daughter, criticizing Bale's characterization, said, quote, he finally had the chance to play a real superhero, and he clearly screwed it up. So here comes the case study part. After filming Vice, Bale plans to reprise his machinist role in Machinist 2, King of Azkaban. To get ready, he must lose approximately 100 pounds. His blood pressure, I'm just making this up, right? His blood pressure is 152 over 84. Total cholesterol is about 260, 65 HDL, 175 LDL. Fasted glucose ranges between 120 and 125, depending on the day. Um, his shoe size is 11 and a half US, 44 European. And he has been, um, during, during exercise, he reports, uh, feeling my heart beat sort of fast and irregularly sometimes, and quote, I get more out of breath than I expect to. He doesn't smoke, he has no diagnoses of any kind, and nothing worrying in his family history. So a case study like this, uh, this one is up. I uploaded all of the review slides, they're, they're available. Um, 
and this, this case study is in those review slides, but something like this, you would be held accountable for. It's not just how many risk factors does he have, you know, where would you classify him? Does he have a, a diagnosed disease? Does he have signs? Does he have symptoms? Where would you classify him? And then how many risk factors does he have within that classification? But also, what would you do? To, he's this and he has to get back down to that. How do you do that? How do you facilitate that role, that, that, that transformation in somebody like that? And remember, to, you have to stratify as step one, what class out of those six categories, where does he fall? And then within the six categories, how many risk factors does he have? And then you would want to do exercise prescription, nutritional interventions, uh, supplements, whatever it is. Whatever the intervention is, you would want to use all of that. Here's how to lose fat effectively material to come up with some sort of plan. Um, okay, so just remember fasting is, it could be 12 hours, right? It could, it could be a 12 hour intermittent fast. Um, you know, it's during Ramadan every year, uh, a lot of people do the daylight hours with uh, no food and those nighttime hours uh, are when all the calories come in. That's a form of intermittent fasting and it's well studied. Uh, people have studied Ramadan to see what changes in metabolism, what changes in catabolism and protein metabolism and human performance and, and glucose control, all of these things, hormone balances, 12 hours to three weeks. Now this is just, it's from the Atlantic. This isn't like a scientific periodical, but if you are just writing down the number of days it took somebody to die while fasting, that's fine because they fact check. You know, in the Atlantic, nobody needs to know science to look at somebody and be like, that person died. How many days did they last? Right. So this is a fine resource for this. But um, but the longest known fast was in 1971 when a 27 year old man survived on water and supplements for 382 days and shrank from 456 to 180 pounds in 1981. Um, Irish Republican prisoners refused food for more than two months before dying. In 2010, a Florida woman on a, a water-only religious fast died within just 26 days. So 26 days, if it's water-only, maybe we're looking at some ion problems, right? So whether it's like sodium and potassium and things like this, maybe we're looking at some complications. You have a lot of fat. If, if you're taking supplements, not you all, but, but the human form carries enough fat to last a while, especially if you're starting with 456 pounds. So fasts can last a while, but you have to be cautious that you don't get hyponatremic. You have to be cautious that key nutrients uh, aren't missing. You know, I mean, if you go a really long time, I mean, like how long were pirates at sea and they needed their vitamin C so they don't get scurvy? You know, uh, we need, good luck, um, responding to an exercise program, to a resistance training program, if you're terrible at synthesizing collagen, right? If you don't have enough vitamins. So fasting, you can incorporate it, but you have to be aware that longer term fasts have consequences. Shorter term fasts seem to be pretty minimal in their, in their consequences. And just as a matter of uh, nomenclature, right? So the definition, it's not starving, because starving is out of your control. I'm starving, says a little kid when it's been like three hours since breakfast or something. That's not an appropriate use of that word. We need to deploy our words with a little more accuracy than that. Uh, but we, we arrive in ketogenesis. We get ketogenic relatively fast in the presence of a fast. So if you want to do a ketogenic diet, a nice way of jump-starting that uh, would just be like, all right, well, let me fast for 24 hours, 36 hours, 48 hours or something, and then transition. That would jumpstart uh, that transition into uh, nutritional ketosis, not ketoacidosis. Ketosis gets a bad name because the original studies were on ketoacidosis, diabetic ketoacidosis, and people were dying. That has nothing to do. This is just two totally different worlds. Uh, that has nothing to do with nutritional ketosis. Yeah. This is a diabetic problem that you have to be aware of. 
Uh, but ketosis, this is, there aren't consequences that people talk about. That's diabetic ketoacidosis is those consequences that people talk about. Um, but so those ketones, right? Ketones are providing the bulk of your fuel when you go into a fast. And especially as that fast prolongs itself day after day, man, you get, I mean, just hour after hour, you're going to be increasing, but day after day, you're going to get really uh, ketogenic. Um, and then that beta hydroxybutyric acid or beta uh, hydroxybutyrate, that's the main one. That's your metabolic one. Acetone um, isn't here, but acetone, that's the one you pee out. You know when people say like, oh, you're a ketogenic diet, your breath smells fruity. Let's just think like, I, it should smell like nail polish remover because acetone is what you're breathing out and that's nail polish remover. I don't know what fruit, how citrusy that fruit has to get to smell like nail polish remover. Uh, but the metabolically active stuff, um, the hydroxybutyric acid, that's the one really you're going to see. But the effects of fasting that have been well supported and repeated, that support has been repeated in the literature, pretty much everything from metabolic syndrome. You know, we talked about that constellation of, of complications um, that Wario seems to exhibit pretty uh, uh, blatantly. So Mr. Wario, you have a big belly, right? So that um, abdominal adiposity, that visceral storage of fat, abdominal adiposity, big waist circumference, um, high triglycerides, we can make that assumption. Um, low HDLs, high blood pressure, definitely has high blood pressure. That is a tense man. Um, and your fasted glucose is a little bit worrisome. So all of these things that would comprise metabolic syndrome, sort of the five domains of, of metabolic syndrome, fasting seems to address them pretty effectively. Um, and then with brain health, uh, we see fasting being... Uh, pr a preventive strategy for uh, dementia, you know, in particular Alzheimer's and, and sort of forms of this. Uh, and we'll talk later in the semester about BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. We're talking about the relationship between exercise and central nervous system and brain cognitive health, uh, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. And we'll start talking about things like that. that's PKB, right? So PI3K, PKB, so the mTOR signaling. Um, there's the MAPK, mitogen activated protein kinase signaling, the same stuff that would be hypertrophy in your skeletal muscle, which we'll get into soon. This is brain drive neurotrophic factor binding to track B, tropomycin receptor kinase B. And fasting, uh, we do seem to see almost similar effects of exercise from, from that perspective um, in its role in the brain. But a lot of the claims that people make, remember, like, oh, you get growth hormone. Ghrelin, GHR, growth hormone releasing. Um, we're gonna release that and from the stomach and then uh, act on the hypothalamus, right? We're, we're gonna like food seeking behaviors, but also we will cause the release of growth hormone and growth hormone makes us huge. Yeah, but that's not how it works in fasting. Fasting is a context. And if you release growth hormone in that context, it doesn't do all the tissue hypertrophy that people talk about. Um, because IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor 1, is most of the labor for growth hormone. In terms of tissue interaction, skeletal muscle hypertrophy, that's a bunch of IGF that's doing it. And IGF gets released downstream from growth hormone, from the liver, uh, but also in the presence of fasting, you're going to be binding the IGF to uh, binding protein 1. There are six of those binding proteins. Um, and it, the best thing fasting can do in the presence of cancer is um, if you use it as an adjunct therapy, if you use uh, fasting, intermittent fasting, uh, or a fasting mimicking diet, FMD, fasting mimicking diet, these in conjunction with proper care of the tumors uh, seems to enhance the effect. It's good a little bit on its own, you know, the, the therapies are good on their own, but together, that is a pairing. That was a pairing when you, when you do them together. Um, and these just the relationship with aging and what you want to see, I mean, all the BDNF, brain drive neurotrophic factor stuff, the synaptic plasticity, um, enhanced cognition, neurogenesis, reduction of inflammation. Uh, and so all of these cognitive 
effects are really good with fasting and just repeat it over and over and over. They find it all the time, find an animal model, find a human model, what, however you do the experiment. These are pretty solid uh, that we found. Um, and the long-term stuff, it's just, this is a nice conclusion, summarizing statement to make about fasting, which is preclinical studies and clinical trials have shown that intermittent fasting has broad spectrum benefits for many health conditions, such as obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, cancers, and neurologic disorders. Animal models show that intermittent fasting improves health throughout the lifespan, uh, whereas clinical studies have mainly involved relatively short-term interventions over a period of months. So we're not doing the same human models on lifespan and fasting, but we can sort of generalize with a sense of proportion from animal models to us, but the long-term stuff, uh, you know, reduced abdominal fat, reduced inflammation, reduced blood pressure, less of that Honda HRV. What was HRV, Nathaniel? Do you remember what that was? It's a heart rate variability. A heart rate variability. Something, I think it was something else for this. Um, but insulin sensitivity is improved on the lipid metabolism, right? So we're looking at your triglycerides and LDLs and HDLs. We improve in our health profile long term. So it's not just I fasted yesterday, I'm, I'm better today, tomorrow's horrible. If you do intermittent past, uh, fasting for a period, right? If it's you do it for a month, you do it for two months intermittently, um, you're going to start seeing more chronic effects uh, to this. Just shout when you figure out your HRV. Um, now with exercise, remember exercise and fasting, typically we're not helped if we are, um, our performance deteriorates a little bit in the presence of fasting. So I'm not that fasted. My last meal was like, 8 p.m. or something like that. But my next meal is going to be breakfast tomorrow. And if later tonight, I rode an exercise bike for 10 minutes this morning and it felt fine. But if tonight I were to go try to go all out in some perform, try to get like a PR in something, uh, that would be tough. I wouldn't, I wouldn't PR today, you know, on a fasting day. Uh, but people who are much better athletes tend uh, to suffer fewer consequences in terms of uh, performance than people who are in slightly worse shape. Luigi's is just moving like more slowly than Mario is. Mario appears to be in better shape, physique aside. So uh, for human performance, uh, you don't fast on your, on your competition day. Unless your competition day is like, I'm a runway model and I just need to not be bloated or something. Okay, that's a different kind of performance, right? That's not cardiovascular or, or you know, muscular endurance or power or whatever. Um, but to, to convert Mario into um, you know, an ectomorph, to, to, to go from endo to ectomorph with Mario, fasting is gonna work. If you do aerobic activity while fasted, we're seeing an increase in circulating free fatty acids, an increase in lipolytic activity. We're seeing an increase in beta oxidation and we're seeing those effects uh, on a scale, on a, on a you know, like bod pod or, or fit 3D or whatever. We can see those effects. But remember that those claims about IGF and growth hormone, the claims about growth hormone, but the reality about, about IGF, uh, we do increase protein catabolism a little bit in the presence of a fast. Protein catabolism does turn up, and um, this is the proteasome, the ubiquitin proteasome system. There's our proteasome. There's a protein. Remember, a protein is a string of amino acids, and the proteasome is going to rip it up, and, and, and here's our individual amino acids. And we can use these to reconstitute other proteins. Think about, like, a used car. Let's say it's a Honda HRV. Okay. And how many years before it's just like too unreliable, that car? I mean, yeah, you change the oil sometimes, but like, oh, it's just, it's going to break down. It overheats. It's like changing from one year to the next. It always catches. It makes some weird noise that if you listen to car talk, they would make you make that noise into the mic. 
Does anybody know what car talk is? Mm -hmm. <laughs> is Nathaniel the only one who knows what car talk is? It's an NPR, like it, it's been on for 500 years. And it's like these two guys who must be 500 years old. Um, and and people call in to say, here's what's wrong with my car. And make a noise. Um, but at some point, every single car would be better if you just melt it down and make a new one. The car would be more reliable if you just recycled all of its components, you know, melt down the metal and you know, form some new pipe and some new whatever out of it. And that's what this is. We are breaking down our proteins, autophagy, um, autophagy, auto eating. Let's eat up our own stuff. And then, and then, you know, we have the cud that we just chewed and let's make something new out of it. So um, these amino acids go on to make new proteins, but the old proteins that are damaged or misfolded or, you know, whatever, in excess, if we have too, these um, we, we chew up into, into a cut of a kind. Are you sure it's not heart rate variability? Maybe it's heart rate variability. Yeah, I think you said something. Um, yeah. It's like heat recovery ventilator. But oh, that, that was the other thing. Okay, it's probably heart rate variability. That's probably what it is. Or human coronavirus. Yeah, I don't, I don't think it's the nose, <laughs> like a sneezes. Um, yeah, defense. well, maybe there'd be immune system function in our defense against rhino uh, virus. Uh, so G Cutler here. Okay, let me just read this. Let me just read this. So this is, I, I went and found this morning. So I'm like, you know, I need somebody who's making claims about, about growth and stuff. So first, this is like the first thing that came up. I just like, fasting growth hormone. It was like the first thing on Google, um, written in 2018. Eight health benefits of fasting, backed by science. Number six, increases growth hormone secretion, which is vital for growth, metabolism, weight loss, and muscle strength. Human growth hormone is a type of protein a hormone that is central to many aspects of your health. That's true. In fact, uh, research shows that this key hormone is involved in growth, metabolism, weight loss, and muscle strength. Also true. Several studies have found that fasting could naturally increase human growth hormone levels. That's also true, but we're starting to derail a little bit in the implications. Uh, one study in 11 healthy adults showed that fasting for 24 hours significantly increased levels of HGH. Sure, yeah, you can do that, right? Notice IGF doesn't appear anywhere in here. Another small study in nine men found that fasting for just two days led to a five-fold increase in the HGH production rate. Now, HGH is pulsatile, um, and so when it releases, just like if you um, sleep really badly once, you, just, you were supposed to release a bunch of growth hormone at night, you just release it in the day. Serially bad sleep, you're gonna have uh, more complications, but, um, but this is sure, yeah, we're, we're getting a five-fold increase in HGH production rate, but with a pulsatile hormone and measuring that, I haven't read that study. Uh, plus, fasting may help maintain steady blood sugar and insulin levels throughout the day, uh, which may further optimize levels of HGH. As some research has found that sustaining increased levels of insulin may reduce uh, HGH. Summary, studies show that fasting can increase the levels of human growth hormone, an important hormone that plays a role in growth, metabolism, weight loss, and muscle strength. Okay, the implication is if you fast, you have an advantage in gaining strength. You have a five-fold increase in growth hormone. You're gonna be huge by fasting. Total nonsense, right? That's not how it works. Um, and so Jay Cutler over here, like, I got so huge by eating nothing. Nothing went to my mouth and I got huge. Metabolism doesn't work in that way. Now, what proteins are degraded that's where we'll end. We'll end with Jay Cutler too. Jay Cutler will be our last slide talking about um, the rate of protein catabolism and which proteins are vulnerable. Um, and can we preserve skeletal muscle tissue uh, in the presence of fasting? Are we sentencing other proteins um, to the slaughterhouse, um, to the proteasome house? And so that's where we'll wind up, but metabolism, so we've been talking about metabolism for a while, but these root words, you know, anabolic and catabolic, anabolism and, and catabolism, you know, what do these things actually mean? Um, you know, we metabolize stuff, you eat stuff, you eat food, some of it you can keep on board, some of it you can't, you shit out the stuff you can't, right? Um, we, we burn a lot of the stuff that we can keep on board and we excrete the stuff that, that, that we can't keep. Um, metabolism is, again, the summation of all of these chemical reactions that take place between, you know, what we eat and what comes out, which is a tube, 
and some stuff leaves that tube and enters circulation and enters our, our tissues. Um, so we capture some of the energy from that. But catabolism is just the breakdown, the degrading, the lysing, the excretion, the elimination. That's catabolism. Think breakdown for cat uh, catabolism. Anabolism is take that matter and make ourselves bigger. Anabolism is keep that stuff. Don't lose it, don't excrete it, don't burn it, keep it, have it on board. That's anabolism. Now, metabolism, people use the word meta just to mean anything. Um, but if you think about what the word actually means, you know, Aristotle wrote metaphysics after he wrote physics. I wrote physics, what comes next, what's after? Metaphysics, after physics. That'll be my book. I mean, he's like literally referring to a calendar. I mean, there's a little bit more to you know, beyond physics, right? Fine, sure. Um, the metacarpals. Okay, here are the carpals. After the carpals, we have metacarpals. This means after, right? Um, and the uh, metatarsals, the tarsals and metatarsals. Uh, metaplasia, if you metastasize, there's metaphysics, uh, metamorphosis, uh, a metaphor, meta analysis. Metal doesn't, uh, that didn't quite work, but, um, but plasia, right, is formation or molding or development. Metaplasia is like after you've grown and developed. All right, let's change cell type at that point. Metaplasia, after your growth is done. Stasis, right, that's like a stagnation. It's, it's equilibrium, you're stagnant. Um, metastasis, a metastasis, if you metastasize, is you know what, we've been kind of sitting here, stagnant, dormant for a while. It's time to march. It's time to start moving. Let's metastasize. After stagnance, let's move. Metastasize. Uh, meta, so that means after. Bolism literally means to throw. Like you're throwing a ball. Is, is that like simple? Um, so this is the 1834 etymology, uh, etymological dictionary of the English language. And bull, to cast or throw, as you know, hyperbole, figure of speech in which anything is thrown or carried beyond. Or, so we're throwing. So metabolism is after throwing. The literal definition of metabolism, after throwing. So think about where these, where bullism might appear, an embolism, right? You throw a clot. It means into throw. You throw a clot. An embolism, right? A clot gets thrown. Um, catabolism, kata means down, or downward. Um, so in yoga, if you want like, you know, kata dog, you could be very technical in your in your yoga postures. Um, so that just means down. It's like a cataract. It's a waterfall, it's like falling water, right? Cataplexy, you fall down. Catastrophe is a downturn. Um, catabolism means you throw down. So metabolism is after throwing. Catabolism means you throw down. So anabolism, and that means up. You just throw upward. You're just throwing upward. It would be cooler if we used um, an, right, as or a as, as this anti, um, the root word uh, meaning not or without. You know, like you have a theist and an a theist. Yeah, whatever. A thing and an a thing, it means like without, or an and thing means, uh, means without. So if you think about it from that perspective, this isn't the real perspective, but it would make more sense. Anarchy, right? No leader. Um, anaerobic, no air. Anoxic, specifically no oxygen. Anorexic, no appetite. You just keep going on with all of these things. Um, and that would be, you know, if we're going to do an bowl is a mug we're not throwing we're keeping it would make sense we're keeping on board that which wasn't thrown but that's not what it means it just means you throw up so catabolism means you throw down and uh, anabolism means you throw up metabolism is you know what you've done um you've thrown a lot some of it went down some of it went up what's left over the summation of all chemical reactions after all of your throwing what do you have left your metabolism um, now, the anabolism of fat, we're not really going to talk about this, you know, the reesterification of fatty acids and, and then uh, triglyceride. Uh, so if, if we're going to synthesize fatty acids first, take a bunch of acetyl-CoA's, right, and 
uh, link them together. Let's let's go in the inverse order um, of what beta oxidation would do, fatty acid synthesis, and then let's uh, reacidify these. Let's make it a um, uh, triglyceride, a triacylglycerol. So that's anabolism of fat. It means keep your fat. Don't eliminate it. Don't break it up. Don't burn it. You know, like create and store and amass your fat. Um, catabolism of fat, we've been going through that, right? Begin with lipolysis, going to beta oxidation, all that stuff. So the anabolism of fat means build it up. Catabolism of fat means break it down. The anabolism of carbohydrate, gluconeogenesis. If we're talking about glucose, gluconeogenesis, creation. So make new glucose out of non-glucose things. And then glycogenesis means let's make glycogen. So gluconeogenesis and glycogenesis, that's carbohydrate anabolism, right? So this is um, like glycogen, just get some insulin in you. You're gonna be doing glycogenesis. Let's make a bunch of you know, glycogen uh, synthesis, um, glycogen synthase being the enzyme. <clears throat> Catabolism of carbohydrate glycolysis. So we'll talk more about it later, but let's break up our carbohydrates. That would be the catabolism of carbohydrate. and. It depends on glucose or, or glycogen. You break them down a little bit differently. Now, amino acid degradation, a lot of this, a lot of amino acid degradation is this, anabolism of carbohydrates, gluconeogenesis. Gluconeogenesis, that's what a lot of your amino acid degradation is. Um, but we're creating Krebs cycle intermediates. We're creating sugar. That's what we're doing with, with our amino acids. If we're not going to use them, uh, for translation, if we're not going to use amino acids for translation, meaning creation of proteins, just put them into the Krebs cycle, right? Make carbs out of them, stuff like that. Um, protein catabolism, uh, that we'll talk a little bit about this today, not just like, you know, you eat it and it's in your stomach and it's like super acidic and, you know, but, but um, the lysosome we'll get to soon. I'll mention it later today, but the lysosome has such critical importance to mTOR signaling. The lysosome is so critical for protein translation, for hypertrophy. And so we'll, we'll talk more about it in our, in our anabolism section, even though it's catabolic, that's what it's there for. Um, but protein catabolism, the ubiquitin proteasome system, that's going to be the bulk of your, of your breakdown for the whole protein. Now, what do you do you know, with amino acid degradation? Well, the gluconeogenic amino acids, there's a bunch of them, right? There's a bunch of them in here. Um, leucine and lysine don't appear, but like, there's a ton of these things. You just make, you can make glucose out of these things. There's tons of them. Um, this article, it'll be up later today on the website. All, all these articles will, will be up. Um, so there are a bunch of amino acids and some of these uh, can, are, are ketogenic or gluconeogenic, but leucine and lysine um, those two are only ketogenic. Gluconeogenesis is just the uh, reverse, I guess, of glycolysis. Yeah, um, in a spiritual sense. That's in definitely sense. in a spiritual sense. You know that the course, the roadways, is different. But you, you. End there. Yeah, because you, know, you pyruvate, you just convert pyruvate back into glucose. There's no similar enzymes that are a part of that? Or... There's overlap of, of a bunch of stuff. Um, like a, a, a major entry point is going to be glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. And that's like right in the heart, it's the center of glycolysis. And, and so there's, there's overlap. How much overlap depends. And I wouldn't be able to recite every pathway, but some overlap, but not completely. Um, so protein metabolism, um, step one, you break down the whole protein into peptides, into, into chains, into smaller chains. Remember, we, a protein is just a string of amino acids. Um, insulin has 51 amino acids in a row. It's like polypeptide hormone. Um, growth hormone, I think it's 191 uh, amino acids. The, so these, these proteins just have different, it's just strings of amino acids and those amino acids 
fold up. Actually, growth hormone could be, there's versions of growth hormone um, that have different amounts of amino acids. Um, but the 22 KD, the, the, the normal version of growth hormone everyone talks about, I think has 191. So step one, break down the little peptide chains. Uh, step two, break those chains down into their individual components, their individual amino acids. Um, step three, this amine group is nitrogen over here. Um, if we're going to convert an amino acid into something else, if we're going to use an amino acid for a non-amino acid purpose, right? We're going to have to get rid of that. Nitrogen part. So um, you can convert it into this stuff, right? Pyruvate. You can make pyruvate out of it. We all know what that is. That's the end of glycolysis. Uh, we all know what acetyl-CoA is, right? That's the entry product into the Krebs cycle. Um, and then these, we're looking at uh, intermediates in the Krebs cycle. Not the entry, but, but these intermediates. Um, and you know oxaloacetate. That's the last thing and the first thing. Right, Soloacetate is what the acetyl CoA binds to. So, amino acids, not every single one can be converted into every single one of these, but the collection of the, your 20 amino acids have numerous fates that they can, roads that they can travel, and those would be the destinations of those roads. Now, if you, it's not like this is the end destination of something where it's like, well, I convert into pyruvate. Okay, done. You're just storing pyruvate now. Like obviously, you know, pyruvate, um, you're probably gonna convert into acetyl-CoA. You know, so there's, there are additional destinations other than these, but these are the sort of the big stops. So here, so again, see lysine and leucine are in green over here. Those are the ketogenic only. You're not gonna make glucose out of those two. Um, they will contribute to ketones but they won't contribute to glucose. Uh, but you will get an insulin response. Go take some leucine. You'll get an insulin response off of that. But it's ketogenic. Um, so where these things go, um, starting with pyruvate up at the top, oh, and just again, what gluco, uh, glucogenic or ketogenic, what they're contributing to. Uh, and so for the legend in that thing. So starting up top, you know, alanine, glycine, threonine, tryptophan, all of these can form uh, pyruvate. Now, you don't need to write all of these down. It's just being aware, very generally, of what happens when people say, oh, you're just burning up your protein, right? So you're using protein as fuel. Um, you're far enough along in your exercise program, and you didn't need enough carbs, and carbs are protein sparing, and so you're not sparing your protein, you're consuming it. You've heard that, that sentence about carbs are protein sparing before, right? These sentences that people say, um, you know, um, ketosis is the incomplete breakdown of fat. You know, carbs are protein sparing or um, fat burns in a carbohydrate flame or PFKs are rate limiting, stepping like calling. The people just have slogans that they talk about things. And so when you encounter a slogan, when you encounter um, some memorized line, you know, what you want to do is understand it more completely than the speaker, ideally. Um, so when you, because you won't use those slogans, right? Because you'll describe things in an accurate way. Uh, the people who rely on slogans usually don't quite understand what those slogans mean because the slogans aren't quite true usually. Um, or at least they're, they're a fraction of a larger truth. So um, a lot of your amino acids, not all of them, but a bunch of them uh, can be converted into pyruvate and you know the fate of pyruvate. You just have to get rid of the amine group, right? You have to get rid of the nitrogen uh, first. So convert those into pyruvate. Um, so, you know, threonine, cysteine, serine, alanine, tryptophan, and glycine. So all of these amino acids, here's your destination. Um, but if you don't need to do this, you know, if you just went to the buffet and you have a ton of food on board, it's like, this isn't really, you're not making, uh, converting amino acids into pyruvate if you just left the buffet, right? This is when protein becomes uh, a source of energy to fuel whatever it is, your, your aerobic activity, it's a soccer game, and it's in like the 12th overtime or something. It's like, okay, now uh, protein is, is starting to become 
a energy substrate that is that is contributing to the to our metabolism to our catabolism. A bunch of stuff can go into acetyl CoA. Um, notice that um, leucine over here is, is a bit quicker right? in its in its transition as opposed to say phenylalanine has to go through tyrosine first and that's important that little step right there tryptophan has a long journey um there's isoleucine there's leucine you have a relatively straight shot for for those ones uh, but that phenylalanine and the tyrosine um does anybody have okay what's in the propel is is there um is it what's the sweetener Is it like sucralose? Sucralose, okay, that's like chlorinated, just like. Sucralose, yeah. Okay. Right. Um, so the equal packets, which is um, aspartame, right? So aspartame is the equal packets. This is just, this is two amino acids, right? It is aspartic acid, aspartame, right? And phenylalanine. So these, the equal packets, and they're all, pretty much all of these are fine. Yeah, there's, for the most part, there's very conditional research in which um, people should worry. But this is the one um, where the phenylalanine in the equal packets, there's a warning label. You know, if you're a phenylketonuric, beware, somewhere on here. Phenylketonurics contains phenylalanine. It's just aspartic acid and phenylalanine. Leave, leave like your Coke out in the sun, whatever. And if those amino acids separate, it's not sweet anymore. It just tastes like it has a tiny bit of protein powder in it or something. Um, but phenylalanine, if you get a bunch of that, you have to convert it to tyrosine. Okay, so phenylketonuria, a phenylketonuric means somebody with phenylketonuria. And I guess they just didn't have enough room to say, people who have phenylketonuria, beware. Um, but this warning label on, on these, because that phenylalanine, uh, you have to convert it to tyrosine. And this enzyme, phenylalanine hydroxylase, uh, is supposed to do that conversion, and it's defective. Genetically, that enzyme is defective. So you get hyperphenylalaninemia, an unnecessary word in the English language. Um, your phenylalanine builds up, right? Because you can't convert it to tyrosine. Um, and so, uh, you, you wind up with a ton of this stuff. So some of it is going to be transaminated uh, to phenylpyruvate. You're going to try to dispose of this uh, somehow, um, all of this phenylalanine. And then when, um, so this one is actually detectable in the urine. Uh, but if phenylalanine builds up, in part because you can't convert it to like the coolest amino acid that you have, like what you make dopamine out of and stuff. Um, if you can't convert it to, to tyrosine, you're going to build up your phenylalanine. Now, amino acids get into the brain, your like cortical metabolism, they get into the brain in a couple of ways. The large neutral amino acid transporters are an important way. And we'll talk about that with um, right before Thanksgiving. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about the large neutral amino acid transporters uh, in the context of tryptophan. But if you saturate those transporters because you have so much phenylalanine, you can't get the other amino acids upstairs. You have to transport them and they won't go there. And so you get, that's bad meaning like nobody in this room has phenylketonuria, otherwise you wouldn't have made it this far. That's, I mean, it's really horrible for, for, I mean, you can't have like a glass of milk without like suffering brain damage. Um, it's like, you have to be really cautious. Um, so it's important. Our protein metabolism, right? They have destinations. These amino acids have particular destinations, particular ways of converting them and breaking them down and integrating them into other metabolic uh, pathways. And for the most part, what we're doing is just throwing in a bunch of, of uh, Krebs cycle intermediates. So it's like, you know, you don't need enough carbs, carbs are protein sparing, you're using protein for fuel. What does that mean? It means this. We know what Krebs cycle is, and we're just funneling amino acids into it and pissing out nitrogen. Um, yeah, again, we're not going to go through all of these things, but, but alpha ketoglutarate, that's right there, um, succinyl CoA, fumarate, um, oxaloacetate, all of those things uh, are going to be end products 
of our protein metabolism so we can actually derive some fuel from them. So it's not just making new proteins, it is uh, bolstering our metabolism so we can get through that, you know, 12th over time. Um, just another look at sort of all the same stuff there. Um, so remind me what a ketogenic diet is. Yeah, yeah. Well, usually, yeah, the higher the fat, the better. Um, and what's his urine team? One without a name. Okay. Oh, you do have a name. Okay. So um, not nameless anymore. <laughs> but it's a secret for a few more minutes. Yes, that's us. Point one um, Yeah, so a ketogenic diet is, it's like you eat a ton of fat and make sure you get some protein in there too. And then just eliminate carbs the best you can. Everything has carbohydrate in it. Eat an egg, eggs have carbs, right? Not much, right? Eat meat, there's glycogen in there. Now, whatever you put in your mouth, there's some carbohydrate. And so like saying like, I don't eat any carbs. Okay, we have to accept the spiritual truth of that sentence because the letter of the law cannot possibly be true unless you're fasting. Um, and then like you drink a little orange juice. Certainly there's bugs in there, right? They got ground up with, uh, you know, oranges. And stuff. There's protein in every, or there's um, uh, carbs, rather. Yeah, I guess orange juice. <laughs> That was a terrible analogy. But yeah, eat um, Propel Fitness water, and surely there's a little bit of carbohydrate in there somehow. So, uh, so uh, a ketogenic diet, though, is, is really high fat, and it tends to be moderate protein and really low carbohydrate. And so um, gluconeogenesis, right, oxaloacetate, gets stripped out in the liver, gets stripped out in the liver, and so acetyl-CoA comes to bind, doesn't have anything to bind to, so you can connect acetyl-CoA to themselves, and you're gonna make ketones out of that, and ketones are a major source of fuel. Now, people will say like, yeah, but the preferred energy source is carbohydrate, because if you eat carbohydrate, that's what you're metabolizing. So obviously your body desires carbohydrate metabolism. It desires sugar, because sugar is preferred. There's sort of a euphemism in the way we describe these things. Um, you know, if you have, think about, if you have some terrible job you have to do, and you just, uh, you just have to do this thing so I can clear my schedule. It's not like that's your preferred activity. It's like a terrible thing with an urgent timeline. Oh, this is my preferred activity. It doesn't make sense in that context. And it's the same thing with when you introduce sugar. Does sugar burn better than ketones? No, it doesn't. Um, alcohol is our preferred energy substrate. If you drink alcohol, if, if you put a bunch of alcohol on you, you're going to have preferential metabolism of the alcohol. The sugar has now become booze. Booze preferentially let's metabolize that over, over the regular sugar, right? And then the regular sugar let's metabolize that over the ketone. Whatever you're introducing, calling it a preferred energy substrate is a euphemism for the reality of biochemistry, um, which is preferential substrate selection isn't about its efficiency or its effectiveness or how healthful it is. Um, so a ketogenic diet, you know, again, as people talk about ketones, like, yeah, that's not the preferred. What you, it's better though. Like, well, what do you mean preferred? Um, you, you don't, have, ketones are a very effective uh, source of uh, metabolism, but, but the acetyl-CoAs get bound to each other. Now we have extracellular degradation. We're not going to talk about this, but just like eat food and you're going to start digesting that pretty hastily. Um, but that's not in the cells. We're not digesting protein in the cells. Um, autophagy, autophagy, um, that's what we're, we're dealing with the cells themselves here. Um, so intracellular degradation. Um, calpanes, there's a bunch of these, there's proteases. Uh, but the proteasome, the ubiquitin proteasome system, that proteasome and the lysosome, the two big ones. Those are the two big ones. And again, we're, we are degrading proteins into uh, you know, chopping them up into their individual amino acids, and then we can use those amino acids for other things. So it's just a system of recycling. 
Um, and then the lysosome is critical for hypertrophy. If you don't have a lysosome where mTOR can, can do its work, oh, you're gonna be tiny. Like, <laughs> that's like horrible. Um, I mean, you're gonna have bigger problems than that. But, um, but this is, it's, yes, it is protein degradation, but it's critical for anabolism too. And the proteasome is a major source of degradation. So um, that video, that's what this slide was, but I uploaded this slide uh, and so if you just watch that video, it's like three minutes or something and it starts advertising drugs <laughs> and you can stop there, <laughs> but it does give you that, that um, characterization. It, it does give you this image. So what I was, what I was saying before class about if like I, I read the first Game of Thrones book, the, the whatever, the um, Song of Ice and Fire, Game of Thrones, I read that book. And there are so many characters, and I would have been so lost trying to read that book if I hadn't first watched the show and said, you know, oh, that's like Kit Harrington, <laughs> whatever. That's John Snow. Um, that's what you know. Whenever like it's, it says, you know, here's Cersei, and here's um, you know Ned Stark, and here's there's like a thousand characters, and if I hadn't seen the show first, I, ah, those are just foreign names to me. Like, and it's the same thing with if you watch a video, some three-dimensional video that adds personalities um, to the E1, E2, E3, and the and you know the proteins and the amino acids and the uh, and like if you if you see it first, then you go talk about it. You have that actor, that character, that 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 image in your head. But the ubiquitin proteasome system, intracellular protein degradation. That's what it's for. It's, it's garbage in your proteins. Um, so, but it's not just indiscriminately doing it. The lysosome is pretty indiscriminate. Not always in every situation, um, but the lysosome is pretty indiscriminate in its garbaging of proteins. The ubiquitin proteasome system isn't. This discriminates between one protein and the next. Um, so if a protein is damaged or it's misfolded, it's unnecessary for some reason or misbehaving or whatever, this sentences it to death. That's what that does. So ubiquitin, these are tags. These are little kick me signs, right? And you put it on the protein with a series of steps. You put it on the protein. Um, and E3 does it, whatever. So you, you put it on this protein. And then once you have four or more, kick me tags, ubiquitin tags, that's your death sentence. Now you're on death row. And, and it's like, you don't just wait and wait and wait 20 years while in your cell. I mean, it's, it's pretty quickly, you're, you're gonna be executed. Um, so one ubiquitin tag, okay, you, you got a little bit of time left on your sentence. Two kick me tags, we're getting close. Three kick me tags, we're almost there. Get that fourth one and you are doomed. Um, you know what people say, like, I hate expressions. Uh, run the gauntlet, people say. But a gauntlet is a glove, right? A, a gantlet, like that's that thing where, like if I'm a criminal and all of you have a weapon and I go, and like I run through and everyone like hits me with a stick or throws a tomato or something like that. Um, that's sort of what the ubiquitin proteasome is, what the, what the proteasome is, is a gantlet. Um, and these proteins have been sentenced by a trial of ubiquitin and they run through, but they're actually killed at the end. There's enough like hits with the stick where they're actually dead at the end of the game. Um, but it's, a, it's not a tiny protein, a 76 amino acid protein ubiquitin. So remember, that's bigger than insulin. Our insulin's 51, glucagon's 29. Glucagon's only 29 amino acids, ubiquitin 76, it's not tiny, right? So you're putting on a pretty big like butcher paper sized uh, kick me sign on these proteins. It's hard to miss, right? It's hard to miss that thing. Um, and again, at the end, you see the four ubiquitin tags. Um, that protein gets run through. You save the ubiquitin. You recycle it. That's how you go. You take, and it's right before the criminal runs the gamut, right? You take all four of those kick me signs off, like I'm these for other people. Like there's a shortage of kick me signs in this. Um, and so you recycle those things. You reuse them, the ubiquitin. So the sequence, uh, E1, activate it. Just activate this ubiquitin, get it ready. Put tape on it or whatever, you know, get that kick me sign, you like, 
make, make sure the letters are clear, whatever. You activate it. You consume uh, ATP, you attach an AMP to it. E1, activate it. Um, E2, deliver. This is, this is your postal worker. This is the delivery worker. So when you see ubiquitin proteasome system, it's always abbreviated to UPS. UPS. So the mail carrier of the UPS is your E2. Um, that's what's going to um, deliver the ubiquitin from E1 activated to E3. And E3 does the actual um, attaching of the ubiquitin uh, to the protein. The protein stays there and you're going to put on some other ones. Additional E2s are going to deliver more ubiquitins to tag it to that protein. So in that video, it showed it as a big C, right? A big yellow C, like a fluffy, I know some of you watched the video. <laughs> so you know what I'm talking about. Like, like a McDonald's yellow C in the, in the video. Um, again, that tagging continues. E2 leaves, another E2 comes in and, and you get four tags on this thing, run it through the protein. So, so these would be, here's the protein. It used to be happy. Right, but it was sort of misfolded or like its hair was bad or something, you know? Like that's, you can't even blink your eyes. You're a dysfunctional protein. And so you start putting on these ubiquitin tags, three, four, five, six. They really hated this one. Um, and as soon as you get four on there, that's sufficient to where the proteasome, right, with his little rubby fingers and stuff, is gonna come up and just rip up that protein into a million pieces. That would be a lot of amino acids. Um, Titan has like, you know, 30,000 amino acids. That, that's, that's as long as it gets. A meal, there's a protein with a million. Um, so that's the ubiquitin proteasome system. And we do see it upregulated during fasting. But AMPK, a little bit different. Well, you know, AMPK, we are turning off. We're going to talk a lot about AMPK soon but we're turning off protein synthesis. Okay, the rafter step, we phosphorylate. Um, it's a kinase, this phosphorylate stuff. One of the things that phosphorylates is a rafter, which helps uh, recruit these downstream targets so the mTOR can phosphorylate them. And we phosphorylate them, we just shut it off. You can phosphorylate at multiple sites. Some of them turn on, some of them turn off. Um, and then also tubrin, or tuberous sclerosis complex two tubrin, phosphorylate that. That's the thing that's stopping REB, ROS homolog and rich membrane from activating mTOR. And so AMPK is going to shut off anabolism, but it also is going to turn on the lysosomal system of protein degradation. Ubiquitin proteasome system. Both of those are going to be turned on with AMPK. And for our focus now, we'll talk about this side later, but for our focus now, in the presence of AMPK, we are increasing protein degradation. But remember the lysosomal system um, it doesn't really care what protein it is. Honey badger don't care. That's like, you guys know that video, the honey badger one? That's the lysosomal system. It, there are situations in which it cares a little. Um, certainly with the honey badger too. Uh, the ubiquitin proteasome system is, is very selective. Now, there's just some summarizing articles. I uploaded, they will be uploaded by the time you check. Um, this article, which is a nice characterization of the ubiquitin proteasome system. And then this one uh, also uh, is going up in that folder. And they're just, if you want to dig a little bit deeper, but the level of detail you need to know is just what we've talked about. If the level of detail that interests you is a little bit deeper, you can go swimming in those publications. Uh, the lysosome, this uh, right here, right inside of a cell, right there's the nucleus and there's your lysosome right here. Uh, multiple lysosomes. Um, inside, there are all these proteolytic enzymes. These enzymes that are just going to garbage up your proteins. And inside of that lysosome, you can sense amino acids. Arginine um, is sensed inside of uh, the lysosome. Um, now, proteins are degraded at different rates. This is where it gets important. What we were talking earlier about Jay Cutler, and he starts fasting. Hey, oh, I'm not going to eat for days. I'm going to get huge. That's not how it works, right? What are you going to get huge with? Um, but certain proteins are going to last longer than others. 
And so hemoglobin, that's going to last for as long as your you know, erythrocytes. It's going to last you know, a semester, 120 days or so. It's about the duration that a red blood cell is going to last. Um, Actin-myosin, those are pretty durable. Those last a little while. Those might last a month or so. And then some, some proteins. So a lot of these really short proteins have a really quick um, life expectancy. So some of these small proteins have a much shorter life expectancy. And that's where it becomes important with fasting. And, and yeah, we're increasing catabolism of protein, but which proteins are, are we getting rid of? Now, the way um, to turn on uh, this stuff, the, the way to actually initiate the ubiquitin proteasome system, um, cyclic AMP, what does that activate? PKA, yeah, PKA. So PKA is activated by cyclic AMP. PKA is in part uh, one of the promoters of this. So PKA is a promoter. Um, so you can you can raise cyclic AMP. And this is pharmacological treatments, e.g., forskolin. Where was that? Where did we see that <laughs> on the supplement list? And. and Maybe there's there's something right with with its um, whatever I've done it, but um, but the evidence is not overwhelming that it's great for um, fat metabolism. But or so you can either and there's a lot of ways to increase cyclic AMP. Just go exercise, go exercise, go fast and exercise, even better, right? Or there there are um, pharmacological, supplemental, nutritional things that you can take to do it, um, or inhibit phosphodiesterase. Four. Now, there are different phosphodiesterases, and some drugs, you know, methylxanthines, are non-selective phosphodiesterase inhibitors. Um, theobromine in, in, in coffee, in um, chocolate, and caffeine, obviously, in like coffee and green tea. It's a caffeine, there's some caffeine in chocolate too. Um, theophylline. You know, there's there are these methylxanthines that are non-selective PDE inhibitors. Um, there are also selective PDE inhibitors. And you get into a lot of these drugs and they're targeting a specific one. Um, phosphodesterase 3, 3B, that is your fat. Four is um, nerves, central nervous system and immune cells, stuff like that. That's where this lives. And if you take a, a phosphodesterase 4 inhibitor, uh, I mean, these are drugs for Alzheimer's. So, I mean, man, you will perform better um, if, you, if you're blocking that. Uh, but if you inhibit phosphodiesterase 4 or uh, increase cyclic AMP, you will activate the ubiquitin proteasome system, phosphorylation by PKA. Uh, but there are the longer lived proteins and the shorter lived proteins. Which proteins are we targeting in these, in these situations? Uh, now, the proteasome activity in fasting. Um, whenever we're going to encounter these situations uh, where we have uh, increased uh, glucagon, increased epinephrine, right, we're going to see this environment in fasting. Um, you know, go exercise and fast. And we're going to have increased um, glycogenolysis, glycogenolysis, and triglyceride breakdown. Um, these are stimulants. Uh, if you look at this is forskolin. There's glucagon. That's not glucose. That's like the opposite. Or at least it's a precursor. Uh, forskolin, glucagon, epinephrine, um, and the uh, proteasome activity. Right? Control proteasome activity is much higher in the presence of glucagon in the presence of epinephrine. We're breaking down these these proteins more, but selectively. We're doing it very selectively. Um, and that's really all this is saying. UPS, right? That's the ubiquitin proteasome system. Uh, it doesn't take long for this to be activated. Um, and so that in tissues of fasting organisms uh, where insulin levels fall, cyclic AMP rises, and mTOR activity decreases, both uh, protein ubiquination and the proteasome activity increase. Uh, but you don't have to increase them simultaneously. You can just turn.
turn on the proteasome and increase it a little more without increasing all that ubiquitination. Um, so a lot of this is comparing animal models, right? Let's see what happens in a mouse and then, and then compare it to a person. But the increase in proteasome activity in mouse muscles and liver were clearly evident by 12 hours after food was removed from fed animals uh, and thus represents a rather rapid metabolic response to food deprivation. The timing suggests that a similar uh, enhancement of proteolysis should also occur in humans in these tissues, but maybe, maybe. Um, mice are pretty small, you know, 12 hours without food. Um, you know, how much do they have on board of carbohydrate? How much do they have on board? You know, so maybe, maybe it's like a 12 hour um, uh, time frame. But um, this rapid response long precedes the FOXO, forehead, forehead boxo. Uh, mediated. That's when in the AMPK stuff, you saw FOXO over there. There was ALK1 and FOXO um, were these triggers of, of degradation. So this uh, rapid response long precedes the FOXO mediated induction of ubiquitin ligases and um, autophagy genes that leads to muscle wasting, especially the breakdown of myofibrils, which is evident in rat and mouse models at one to two days after food uh, deprivation. So it takes a little time before muscle proteins are going to be targeted. For muscle proteins are going to be targeted. Um, same article, the FOXO mediated response stimulates the breakdown of long lived proteins, uh, the great bulk of cell proteins to provide the starving organism with amino acids for gluconeogenesis and energy production, and thus serves distinct physiological functions from the PKA mediated enhancement of the degradation of short lived proteins. So remember fasting, and starvation are very different. In periods of starvation, long-term periods of starvation, what we're seeing is muscle wasting. It doesn't take too long to get there. In periods of controlled fasting, you're not really getting uh, the, the muscle protein breakdown. So PKA activation thus suppresses the degradation of the bulk of muscle proteins and the resulting atrophy. So going back to Jay Cutler, we are not growing in the presence of fasting. Yes, you get growth hormone and you suppress IGF and you are not growing. But uh, in, a, in a controlled fast, what proteins are you eliminating? It's unlikely to really be skeletal muscle proteins, contractile proteins, actin, myosin, you know, a myofibril is a string of sarcomeres. And you're not really degrading myofibrils. There are other proteins uh, that are taking uh, that are running the game. Runs. Okay, that's all. We'll, we'll start getting, so Wednesday, remember, we have our, another team competition. I'm going to write a case study, and everyone's going to compete on that one case study, both with exercise prescription or some sort of intervention, it doesn't have to be exercise, some sort of intervention, and uh, risk analysis. So both of those in this next case study on Wednesday. On Friday, we'll start talking about uh, anabolism. <laughs> There's one clap.